Hello and welcome to Newsmakers from your local election headquarters. I'm Jane Ann Bugda along with Andy Mahalshik. We're about six weeks away from the primary election, so we thought we'd sit down and chat with our um, political advisors, experts that we call on um, for... Uh, Advice in all things political, uh, Dr. David Sosar from King's College and David Yonkai from the award-winning uh, LULAC Political Letter blog. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Happy and, to be here. Thank you. And, Thanks, guys. Uh, just today, we just want to take a look uh, as we're getting close to the primary election, an overview of some of the um, races that, uh, that are important to the state. And I guess the most important race everybody has their eyes on is the uh, race for president. But by the time it comes to... Uh, Pennsylvania on April 26th, the primary election. Is the thrill gone? Well, if you want me to break into a B.B. King song, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I think that this time around, uh, the election most likely will be decided by the Pennsylvania primary. And it kind of begs the, big, the bigger question, should we have moved the primary up? to see if we were competitive. What would that do for the state? Uh, I think Mrs. Clinton, Secretary Clinton, has a big lead. Trump has a big lead. So, um, you know, I don't think it's going to be a big factor, unfortunately. Yeah, that's always been uh, the, the argument for the Pennsylvania primary, that we don't seem ever really to have uh, a chance to be in the mix to, to help make the decision. Uh, you, you've got uh, all kinds of races where delegates are being, uh, you know, it's winner take all, uh, uh, still to come yet, but uh, not really of a sense, uh, 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 so many yet before Pennsylvania that you, Pennsylvania never really seems to get a chance. And so that takes away some of the opportunity for these candidates to come here and really press a lot of the flesh. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, campaigning and the ads and everything else that goes with it and the people that come through. And pe but Pennsylvania has always lost out on that. Last time it was competitive was 2008 with uh, Clinton and Obama. Right. And then the time before that was 1992 with Bill Clinton and Jerry Brown running against him. So. Why wouldn't, why, there's been lots of discussion about moving up the prime, the uh, Pennsylvania primary. What would have to happen for that, to make that happen? Uh, you could move it up uh, by date easily enough, but your problem in doing it is that it relies so much on, on all of the other candidates that are running at that time. It's not the presidential. It's that you have, uh, if you wanted to just have a presidential uh, race and, and a primary for that, you could do it. But the cost of having two primaries in that year, I think, would be cost prohibitive. Uh, you have uh, co uh, Congress uh, that, that uh, as, as primaries that you've got to settle yet, the Senate, you've got state reps, state senators, you've got a number of people that will rely on this, and you don't have this, the, the finish of the signing of the petitions until. Uh, just about the beginning of March, mm -hmm. and then to move it up any further than that from April, let's say, to the end of March, you don't have enough time to campaign to get your message across to try to get uh, the voters to support you. And that becomes the real problem. You'd have to move everything. And then do you want to be one of many? Look at all the states yesterday. Look at all the states that were, yeah. like, you know, put together and everything, you know, so. For Super Tuesday, so yeah. there's, so. For Super Tuesday, yeah. So it's no chance of us getting into a Super Tuesday. No, now, exactly, so. no. Well, we could be a middle Atlantic uh, competition mm -hmm. if we had the SEC that yes, was held. There you go. Uh, yeah. We could maybe we have the Middle Atlantic or the New England Middle Atlantic states or something, but uh, it's just not. It's it, it really would be cost prohibitive. I think. Let's write a proposal for 2020. Maybe we could get a consultant's face. Okay, yeah. let's Definitely. try that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk a little bit about voters. Do you think we're well the. the voter apathy, you think it, you're going to see it in this election, or you, with the younger voters, are they interested? Well, the younger voters, I feel, basically are a transient voting bloc. They came out strong for Obama in 2008, and then in 2010, when the Democrats needed them to keep Congress they were nowhere to be found. Same thing in 2012, they were energized for Obama, and then 2014, they weren't there. And uh, it's a very transient voting bloc. But what are, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, no, I was just going to say one of the things that's been happening so far, uh, and I think it's true on both the Democrat and the Republican side, though, is that it's, it seems to have been the Bernie Sanders uh, camp that has, has really seemed to ignite younger 
voters to want to come on out. And still yet, too, uh, which, which doesn't bode well for Hillary, but also, too, the Donald Trump bandwagon seems to also have gotten a number of young white males to show on up. Uh, that seems to be the block in there. So, uh, you know, the number of voters is increasing, uh, which is a good thing. But uh, after all of the hoopla, and, and Lord knows what will happen with the hoopla, how, how it plays on out now, will the voter, will the young block come on out or not, I think. Right. What, you know. But traditionally, correct me if I'm wrong, traditionally a larger voter turnout benefits Democratic candidates, correct? Pretty much so, yep. yeah. Pretty yeah. much so. It depends on, you know, the circumstances and things like that. But yeah. The Latino vote in northeastern in Pennsylvania, especially in northeastern Pennsylvania. We'll be, we'll be talking in the weeks to come about the congressional races, Senate races. How big of an impact could the Latino vote have if they register to vote and get out there? How in, in, in Pennsylvania? I think in Pennsylvania, they'll probably be part of the, the, the decision makers. Uh, how the Latino vote goes will really determine uh, other, a Republican or Democratic uh, victor in, in such a state as Pennsylvania that's been always, I shouldn't say always, but for the most part purple for the last few years. I can't imagine the Latino vote going to the Republican Party where you have two people, Cruz and Rubio, who are Cuban, who were Cuban ancestors, and who had Cuban ancestors, and then uh, Donald Trump, who's been anti-immigration. Mm -hmm. I can't see the Republicans making inroads into that at all. I just can't. And another race we want to talk about uh, has a big impact on Pennsylvanians is the uh, race for U.S. Senate. Uh, Pat Toomey running re-election, unopposed at this time, but four candidates on the Democratic side. And in the next couple of weeks, you'll be hearing from some of those candidates. Andy and I sat down to talk with a few of them. Some thoughts on that race? Well, uh, let me let me go with the two candidates uh, who are the, the main candidates, if you will, Joe Sestak and Katie McGinty. Uh, Joe Sestak should, at least by all accounts, with Democratic Party politics, have uh, a second run at it because he ran a very credible campaign against uh, um, against uh, Pat Toomey. He um, uh, knocked off Arlen Specter in the primary, mm -hmm. and but yet he's not getting no love from the Democratic Party because uh, the Democratic power structure with Ed Rendell and now Tom Wolf is backing Katie McGinty. But both candidates, I think, have a little baggage. You know, um, Sestic, because he lost. And Katie McGinty, a year ago, might have been, uh, you know, uh, doing very well with the power of Tom Wolf. But now with the budget crisis going on, I can't see that that may be a help in terms of being part of the Wolf administration. Yeah. And then the two and, lesser candidates, well. Well, and, and I, I just would speak to those two as well because they're, yeah. they're doing, uh, you know, they're, they're the names. They're the names you know. Uh, Sestek had, a, I think, a, a, a very viable uh, campaign the last time. Uh, did well, but, but not good enough. Uh, Kath, or Katie McGinty was, besides her position now, also, and, and it made quite a name for herself, I believe it was at uh, DCNR uh, yeah. that she was the head of, which, by the way, John Quigley is now the, the head mm -hmm. of uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Harrisburg. But I think you're right. Uh, she, her... Her capital kind of has gone down a little bit with the the way the, the the state of Pennsylvania with this budget madness that we're facing at this point has gone on. And you mentioned very quickly John Quigley is the former mayor of Hazleton. Right. Yes. And we covered him back in the 80s when he was the, 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 the director of the Alliance for Wildlife Center, mm -hmm. City Hazleton. So yes. He's worked. He's paid his dues over the years. Yes, he has. And, yes, he uh, has. A knowledgeable guy. So we are going to take a quick break, and when we uh, come back, we'll continue our discussion about the uh, Pennsylvania primary. As we head to break, here are some important dates to remember. You're watching Newsmakers from your local election headquarters. You can find information on today's show on pahomepage.com. And welcome back to Eyewitness Newsmakers from your local election headquarters. Andy Mahalshi, Jan Bugda. Our special guests today are longtime political analyst Dr. David Sozar from King's College and also David Yonkai from the LULAC Political le uh, Letter, uh, well known in, in northeastern Pennsylvania, to comment on what we use the word experts on politics, but is there any such thing 
in Northeastern and Pennsylvania politics? Is anyone really an expert? We don't know. You be the judge. <laughs> I'm sure there are many people who will tell you that they're experts. Sure they Walking to any bar in Nanticoke. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or Hazleton or Jack. Or Hazel. Yeah. Uh, we were talking before about, we are talking about the elections in general, of course. We talked about the presidential and the state senate. Let's talk about the congressional races. Some interesting races shaping up. Of course, you have the incumbents, uh, Lou Barletta and Matt yes. Cartwright. Uh, let's let's focus on the on the on on the incumbents. Are they going to face a stiff challenge? You think this time around? In the general election. In the primary election. In the primary. Well, Lou Barletta is unopposed. unopposed. But I have to tell you something about Lou Barletta. Lou Barletta, basically, every time I've seen him, he will give a primer on what how Congress works and it's fascinating to see him give his little speech because and not, not speech but talk he gives you a civics lesson every time he presents himself and I cannot imagine that that is going to hurt him in the general election he does he's not haughty he basically says listen when I got down there I wondered why I was there and then three months later I wondered how the rest of them were there he has a good way of presenting himself and I think that's going to give him a really really uh, good uh, um, input is for uh, every election. But we're looking at, the, and who's running on the Democratic side is Michael Marcicano, who was also a former mayor of Hazleton, <laughs> facing a mayor <laughs> of Hazleton, which is interesting to us who are from Hazleton and maybe from the area. Yes. But, uh, and Dave, you're a councilman in Hazleton. I'm a councilman, yeah. Sorry and actually, I served. You are. Mm -hmm. No, I, I thank you for I'm only putting kidding. putting the target on my back. But uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I served two years with with uh, uh, Mike on city council. Uh, uh, he, uh, he, you know, he he did his homework at that time in uh, getting se himself prepared uh, for the council meetings and that, and, and uh, oftentimes offered uh, a number of ideas and so forth. Um, you know, I, I, I wish him well. Uh, he certainly has an uphill battle in the congressional district that he's in. I think that's one of the battles that he faces. And, and I do believe that what Mike would see himself as, uh, a, as much as I know of him from, from the past, he would describe himself, I think, Dave, you might, you might want to comment on this too. I think he sees himself as, as really one of those traditional blue dogs yet, if there is such a thing. Um, he's the old traditional type of Democrat yet that, that would put himself out there. I don't think he sees himself as, as excessively liberal. Uh, and I think if, if anybody has a chance in his Republican, uh, a, a district as, as that is, that might very well have to be the kind of person that, that would run. Plus, he's also going to need a heck of a lot of money because Lou has developed quite a war chest. And the other race, of course, is that of Matt Cartwright, 17th District. He's running unopposed, but he has, on the Republican side, there are two gentlemen running, Matt Conley and Glenn Geisinger. Well, I had, the race. I had the opportunity to meet both of them, Matt Conley, a couple of years ago when he ran in the primary, and he lost to uh, Dr. Moylan, and um, he, um, he's a fascinating person, but he is very um, doctrinaire in terms of the Tea Party uh, agenda, and he will be very uh, factual in telling you what he's doing. But Glenn Geisinger, on the other hand, um, basically feels that he will win the primary because um, he's made no he's made no bones about the fact that he's won more elections than um, Connolly has, and he presented a pretty fascinating strategy as to how he thinks he could overtake Cartwright. He talked about um, Lorraine Cummings in 2012, who ran against Cartwright and lost by 22 percent of the vote, and she only raised twenty thousand dollars. He talked about Doc Moreland, who basically uh, ran Dr. Moreland, who who basically ran against Cartwright in 2014, raised $70,000, lost by 12%. He thinks that if he spends enough money and matches Cartwright dollar to dollar, he may have a shot. And the Cartwright people actually sent out campaign uh, fundraising emails that basically said, we have a self-funded candidate running against us, please help us. So there's a lot of dynamics going on with that, and Geisinger is a pretty interesting guy. It's an interesting race. Yeah. So we are going to continue our conversation when this edition of Newsmakers returns right after this. Check us out on pahomepage.com under the Newsmakers link. Welcome back to Newsmakers from your local election headquarters. Jane Ann Bugged along with Andy Mahalsik, Dr. David Sosar, 
David Yonkai joining us today. And sadly, we lost two lawmakers this week. Um, first, in Dunmore, a councilman, Salvatore Verastro, passed away. 51 years old, a councilman in that area, community in mourning, um, was away on a trip, passed away, sadly. The city uh, in mourning there in Dunmore you're looking at, and also passing away this week, uh, a longtime legendary uh, lawmaker in our area, uh, former Scranton Mayor James Barrett McNulty. Eric Dable takes a look at his life. A single red rose, the trademark of Jim McNulty, sits where the former mayor's portrait should be inside Scranton City Hall. McNulty, for all of his love for Scranton, reportedly never had a portrait done. Wednesday, friends and colleagues remembered the larger-than-life politician. He had a national and international reputation. Judge Tom Munley was friends with McNulty for 40 years. He calls him a political legend. He just loved being part of this city. And he would always say to me, Tom, I'm going to do whatever I can to make this city great. And he certainly did. One of the last times McNulty was seen at a big public event was his 70th birthday party last February. Battling colon cancer, he reflected then on his legacy. I'm most proud of the fact that I was a, a kid that lived in Valley View Terrace, public housing, and became the mayor of Scranton. Many credit McNulty's vision for helping the city's downtown for bringing in what became the Steamtown National Historic Site to Scranton, and for breathing new life into the old train station that became the Radisson Hotel. Even long after leaving office, friends say McNulty never lost his love for his city or politics. I visited him at his house a couple months ago, and uh, as sick as he was, he loved the politics and he loved talking about it. Eric Dable, Eyewitness News. All right, thank you, Eric. And of course, uh, Dave Yonkai and Dave uh, Sozar both met uh, Mayor McNulty. Dave Yonka, you were good friends with him, and, and, and your careers really paralleled, paralleled each other as far as pol interest in politics. Well, I actually didn't meet him until after he was gone from the city of Scranton as mayor. And I met him in a role when he was actually a political consultant. And they talked about how, um, how many elections he lost versus the one that he won. But I think that if you take a look at some of the elected leaders in this area who he actually guided to wins in their victory, it was unbelievable. He was a wonderful political consultant. And he, I'll never forget one of the campaigns that he ran for his wife, Evie. Um, they, he did this um, song from a Broadway show, Getting to Know You. And basically that put her over the top. So he had a very, very, very creative mind in terms of getting a political campaign angle. and. The la one of the last conversations I had with him um, was last year when he was even, you know, planning. Um, he, wouldn't it be great if Biden and um, Hillary Clinton had some kind of uh, meeting of the minds in Scranton sometimes? He was always, always looking for Scranton, either as a mayor, looking to promote Scranton as a mayor or a political consultant. He's going to be missed. And I want to mention that he had a long time... Uh a talk show on WYOU that did talk about politics. And could I mention that real quick? Mm -hmm, At yes. the end of the show, right? At the end of the show, he would always go through like a whole list. Well, you know, Barney um, Barney Lawton is in the hospital. You know, this woman passed away in Dunmore. This guy, and he would always validate people. And that was one of the things that Mayor McNulty said he loved about public life, that people don't really care sometimes about the legislation, but they want to be validated. And he validated people in the city of Scranton. And I remember covering him back in the 80s as a young up, uh, cub reporter, if you will. And he, you were talking about Lou Barletta giving us civics lessons. Mm -hmm. When we asked him questions about issues in municipal government at the local level, he understood, he wanted us to, as reporters, whether you were senior or young reporter, to understand where he was coming from. So sometimes it was like a history lesson, but it was well worth it because you understood the issues. Mm -hmm. And why, he was trying to, he wanted you to understand why he made those decisions. Yeah. Right. He, he was, he was a, 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 a very colorful man, very personable man, uh, to anybody and everybody that he spoke to. Uh, I, you know, it, it, it's... It, it's for both gentlemen uh, that I would say because we're talking about local government. When I talk to my students, in fact, and Dave, I'm sure you'll agree with this, uh, we forget sometimes about the national and the uh, state, and we, we, we focus on them, but the local 
local people like Mayor McNulty are the ones that affect people's lives every single day. They are the heart and soul of our yeah. communities. And they make the sacrifices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, our discussion will begin when uh, this edition of Newsmakers from your local headquarters continues after this break. Check us out on pahomepage.com. We'll be back right after this. And welcome back to Eyewitness Newsmakers, your local election headquarters. Andy Bohalsh and Jan and Bugda, Dr. Dave Sozer and Dave Yonkai. We are wrapping up the program today. We're talking about elections in general. Key dates. You know, we could talk about candidates all we want, but people have to get out there and vote. If you didn't register, please do so. And if you did register, get out there and vote. Yeah, I... It, it, at this point of the game, registering to vote is the most important thing. And it's not just for the young people who are just turning of age right now. It's for everybody out there who wants to make a difference. Uh, it, it certainly is a hotly contested race uh, for all of the seats, be it state or be it federal level at this point. I do hope and I wish that everybody gets a chance to get out there and exercise your right. It's the only way it works. We make a checklist for everything, groceries at a certain age, our drugs, you know, for prescription mm -hmm. drugs and things like that. You have to make a list to uh, make sure that you go out and vote and uh, you participate in the process. Because if you don't, you have no reason to complain. That's right. true. And you know, right. it's interesting. If you listen to local talk radio, the blogs, the webs, that kind of thing, you do on, on your blog, people complain, and I get that. But then ask them if they vote, and they say, well, not really. I don't, I, I'm not even registered. The classic one is, you mean I have to register? <laughs> and then, that really, you have to, we've seen elections come down to one vote or a handful yeah. of votes. Yeah. So you have to register. And we, yeah, want exactly. to, we want to remind you, we do have this information on pahomepage.com. We're under the Newsmakers link over the next few weeks. Well, the Davids back, as I call them, to discuss the upcoming election, and you'll meet some of the candidates. David Square. Yes. There you go. There you I go. like it. There For Andy Mahalchik and everyone behind the scenes, along with David Sosar and David Yonkai, I'm Jane M. Bugda. Thank you for making us part of your day, and we'll talk again next time.